Today we're going to be talking about Jacob and Esau, twin brothers, and they did not get along. Imagine that for just a moment. It was so bad between them, you would ask yourself the question, how will God's purposes ever be accomplished? The promises God had made, how was God's plan ever going to be accomplished when things were so bad? But you know what? God has a way of making things work out. His grace cannot be stopped by our bad behaviors. His power is so great. So that's what God does for us. He looks beyond our faults and he sees the need that we have and he reorganizes all of life, our past, present, and future so that his grace can be made known to us. Chapters 25, 27, and 28 of Genesis recount the lives of Jacob and Esau. They're born as twins to Isaac and Rebekah. And they struggled with each other from the moment of their conception until they died. Even after they semi-reconciled 20 years later, Jacob never could trust himself. Whereas Esau called him my brother, Jacob only called Esau my Lord. He felt always in servitude to him for the things he had done. And they never did really get together as family and they never shared anything after that first reunion. And even their descendants later on continued the struggle for many, many centuries. Edom is where Esau's people settled. Petra down in Jordan, the nation of Jordan, down south in the city of Petra was the capital of Edom and Edom joined in with Nebuchadnezzar to torment and to persecute and to bring into captivity the children of Jacob, Israel. And so God punished them later. But the scriptures do not try to sugarcoat the sins of Jacob and Esau or their parents, Isaac and Rebekah. And when psychologists read this account of how Isaac and Rebekah each favored different sons, they all say, no wonder Jacob and Esau were a mess, you know? But we're all a mess. You could blame your parents, but then they could blame their parents and they could blame their parents. How far are we gonna go with this anyway? Why don't we just stop blaming and realize that we're all a mess because we're all sinners. Both Jacob and Esau exhibited prideful, self-serving, profane attitudes and behaviors. But in spite of all of that, God's grace was still at work. Amen? It really was. In order to see God's grace, however, we have to train our eyes to look beyond the failings of Jacob and Esau and also our own failings. Amen? You got to look beyond your own failings. You got to look beyond the failings of other people. It's like the old magic eye pictures. They call them spectrograms. Did you ever do those? You look at them and there's like a two dimensional, all these colors. All you see is just colors and patterns. But then when you start to focus beyond it, a three dimensional picture comes into focus. How many of you ever seen one of those? Yeah. And you know, at first you don't see it, do you? Those magic eye spectrograms. And then they have all kinds of tricks that you're supposed to do to help yourself see it. Some people never see it. That's amazing. The other day I saw one and something must have happened to my eyes or so I can't see this. And then I, I read the tricks you're supposed to do. You're supposed to uh, take it and put it right up to your nose and then just don't focus on it and then just start kind of going back and just try to see on the other side of it. And as I did that, and I was trying to see on the others, all of a sudden this three-dimensional amazing picture came up, just what I needed to hear. I heart you. I love you. This is exactly what we have to do. In our lives, and as we look at Jacob and Esau, you can't just look at this, you know, two-dimensional thing. Have you ever seen a, a beautiful Persian rug? If you ever turned it over and you saw this mess on the back of it, just a mess, 
It's just so ugly. All these yarns going here and there and everything sticking out and it's like has no pattern. It's just ugly. But that's what it takes when you turn it over and see what's behind it. It's a beautiful pattern. And God lets us see this ugliness of life so that he can train us to look beyond it on the other side of it so we can see a three-dimensional beautiful picture which basically the message is I love you. When your eyes and your brain finally refocus beyond the two-dimensional, you see this deeper message, this deeper image. And so in that vein, here's a few observations about Jacob and Esau and how God's grace was at work in their lives. Number one, think about this. If Isaac and Rebekah had been perfect parents, imagine that. This, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Perfect parents. The two words just don't go together, do they? If Isaac and Rebekah had been perfect parents, then they could have taken credit for the ultimate salvation that was to come through the promised Redeemer, Jesus. As it was, however, because they messed up so badly, you know, Jacob, his favorite was Esau. He loved Esau, and Rebekah loved Jacob. And because of that, the lineage of Christ was established only through God's sovereign and free grace. They didn't earn it. His sovereign grace is powerful in spite of all the sins and the failures of all of the human actors on the stage of history. That means you and me too. Whatever failure you feel like you have had, and there's not a one of us here today that doesn't feel like we've all had some major failure in our lives, but in spite of whatever that failure may be, God's sovereign and free grace has been extended to us. Number two, the profaneness of Esau. Now, in Hebrews it says, be careful lest there be any root of bitterness or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He was profane because he didn't see the value in the things that God was entrusting to him. It was a responsibility. He didn't see his responsibility. And so he was profane in his viewpoint of God. He didn't, in his mind, God didn't really exist. You know, he was profane. Everything about life is profane to people who do not believe in God. I'm sorry to tell you that. But people who don't believe in God, the whole world and all of life is just profane. But this profaneness of Esau was not unique to him. It was proven to be a universal malady, even with the descendants of Jacob. You remember he had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. You can name some of them, Judah, Issachar, Dan, Asher. You know, those are the 12 sons of Jacob. And one of them, he was his favorite. He messed up too. Joseph, his favorite the coat of many colors. But just think of the profaneness of the children of Jacob, the children of Israel. His name was changed later to Israel, one who struggles with God and prevails. But Joseph's children, what did they do? They hated their youngest brother. They sold him into, talk about profane. They sold their own brother into slavery. Imagine it. Judah, the oldest of the sons of Jacob, committed numerous immoralities. David, later on, committed adultery and murder. Jeroboam was an idolater. Ahab and Jezebel were profane murderers and thieves. And basically, the entire Old Testament proves that profaneness is a common malady. And so all the promises of an ancestry for the Savior had to be by grace. Let's go to this one. We see that it's not because of their lack of profaneness, but in spite of their profaneness, they did not deserve or neither did they merit anything of God's grace. Everything that God did throughout the entire Old Testament bears out the fact that God did it not because people deserve it, 
but because God willed it because of his love. Thirdly, the family birthright and the father's blessing was stolen by Jacob's fraud, and then it was lost through his fear of Esau's retribution. Remember, when he came back to his homeland, God had told him to go back. He was so afraid of Esau killing him that he set ahead everything he had. Here it is. It's all yours. I stole from you, and so here's everything back. And so he gained nothing by his thieving ways, and none of it profited to God's plan for the future. You would think, okay, well, he's got all of this money now that the family has, and he's controlling it, and that facilitates Jesus coming in his line, but that did not happen. He ended up with absolutely nothing because of his fear. He ran away. He lost everything, and none of it either facilitated nor did it impede God's sovereign gift of salvation through that family. Number four, the consequences of Jacob's sins placed him in a frame of mind that was ready to meet God. Now, we're trying to see beyond just the two-dimensional problems here. Kind of look beyond it and, and think about this. The consequences of Jacob's sin placed him in a frame of mind that was ready to meet God. And he met God in a dream. And the dream was all about God's sovereign grace. You remember it? Jacob's ladder? Jacob saw a ladder, and this ladder had already been set up between earth and heaven. In his vision, in his dream, the ladder was there already. It was already there, and it was set up from earth to heaven. God had already come to earth and set this up, and angels were first ascending. It wasn't like they were coming from heaven first. They were ascending from earth, and then they were descending back to earth from heaven. What does it mean? It's a vision of God's sovereign choice that he had already established on earth with angels already at work, constantly ascending to heaven with the needs of the gracious covenant that God had given and then descending back with the answers to those needs. You see how God works? This is the covenant, Jacob. Don't be afraid. This is what I've done already. I've set this up. And my angels are always going to be ascending with the needs and descending back with the answers. Don't be afraid. Go ahead. Go back home. Take care of things. And so those are just five little ways that we can kind of look beyond what was happening with Jacob and Esau and see God's grace in the background. But also... Christians today, you and me, need to see beyond the obvious things that are happening in our lives, our own personal lives today. All of us this morning have challenges, human failings. They plague us. But I want you to know that all of your problems and all of your disappointments and all of the things that are challenging you right now is nothing more than a magic eye. It's nothing more than a spectrogram. It's a two-dimensional thing that doesn't look like it has any sense attached to it. But if you will just stop focusing on those things and just start to focus on what's behind it, here's what you'll see. Here's five little maxims that St. Francis de Sales, and it's in his little book called Consoling Thoughts on the Trials of an Interior Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can download it. It's called Consoling Thoughts on the Trials of an Interior Life. Here's the five maxims, and I, I just want to go through them briefly. The first maxim is this. All things work together for good to those who love God. St. Francis points out that God is constantly and miraculously drawing good from evil, and that he is famously and eagerly disposed to do this for those who give themselves unreservedly to God. He says, David would not have been so full of humility if he had not sinned. Mary Magdalene would not be so full of love had she not been so debauched. And he goes on and he says, Behold the great dispenser of mercy. That's God. 
He changes our miseries into favors. And from the adder, the poisonous snake, from the adder of our iniquities, he makes a salutary balm for our souls. That's beautiful language. And then he says, be assured that while you love God, all will turn to your good. If God places the bandage of ignominy over your eyes, what does that mean? It's shame. Have you ever been ashamed of yourself? I hope you have, because that's very important, to be ashamed of yourself. If you have no shame, then you don't understand what this is about to say. If God places the bandage of ignominy, shame, over your eyes, it will render you an admirable sight and a spectacle of honor. God has one thing to do today, and that is to confront my pride and your pride. So don't be surprised at this bandage of ignominy that he places over our eyes. Number two, the second maxim is that God is your father. Think about it. God is your father. He says, what then do we have to fear, being the child of such a father? without whose providence not a hair of your head can fall. Think about it. Not even one hair can fall from your head without God knowing about it and renumbering the hairs on your head. He said it's wonderful that being the children of such a father, we have no other worry, no other anxiety than to love and serve him. He will protect us and deliver us. And where we cannot walk, he will carry us. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all of these things. Our Father knows. And the great prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. The third maxim is what our Lord then asked his disciples. Quote, has anything been lacking to you? He said, when he sent out the twelve, he said, you came back. You went, I sent you out without script, without silver, without a sword, without an extra pair of shoes, without anything. And he says to them, did you lack anything? And they said, Lord, we lacked nothing. And so he then used that experience later and reassured them that he would never let them go without what was necessary. Have you ever perished from your past adversities? Any of you? Have you perished yet? Are you dead yet? None of you are dead yet. You haven't perished from your past problems and adversities. Then why should we not have courage to keep going, to advance in spite of our current adversities? God did not allow us to suffer lack in those, nor will he in the future. If God commands you to walk on the waves of adversity, fear not, doubt not. God will be with you, says St. Francis. And the fourth maxim is simply eternity. Eternity. In view of eternity, our transitory inconveniences don't matter very much. We are advancing into eternity, and already we have one foot there. Do you realize that you have one foot already in eternity? Some of us have more of a foot in than others, but we all have a foot in eternity. Then St. Francis says, are we aware that our tribulations of just two or three days are preparing us for an innumerable eternal consolation? And shall we be unwilling to endure them? And then the last maxim is this, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus. St. Francis says, plant the cross of Jesus crucified in your heart. And all the crosses of this world will appear to you as so many roses. The mystics, nearly all of them, made a distinction between the, quote, superior and the, quote, inferior part of the soul or the mind. St. Francis tells us that the cross, if firmly planted in our superior mind, will cause us to take little notice of the annoyances presented to us by the inferior. We all have whims and inquietudes 
which proceed from and are stirred up by our senses and our passions in the inferior mind. But if the superior part of the soul has the cross firmly planted in it, it will worship at that cross and keep us resolute. And so if we thank God for all of our trials and troubles, according to these maxims, we're actually refocusing our life. We're looking beyond and behind what we see on the surface. It will make our spiritual eyes refocus on the true meaning of our problems, our sufferings, and then we will begin to rejoice at that revelation. When I was a young Christian, I had the good fortune of going to Tyler, Texas and being involved in an internship there. And I was about 20 years old. I was between my sophomore and junior year of Bible college. And I had a difficult family life. My father, because of his condition with Parkinson's, turned into an alcoholic. And life was difficult during those teenage years. It was troubling. And so I came into that internship with a lot of emotional and spiritual and and, uh, psychological baggage. And I, I was just so blessed that God led me there because this pastor was a counselor. That's what he did. And he actually hung out the shingle. We were told in seminary, don't ever hang out a shingle saying counselor. But he, he did. He hung out the shingle. That's what he did. That was his gift. And every Sunday afternoon for a year, I had the privilege of going and talking to him about all my problems and along with all the other interns. And it was such a blessing. And here's what he did. He actually demonstrated this. A lady came in who had just been beaten by her husband. And he let her come into the midst of this meeting of of the interns with him. He directed her through this process. And his process is this. First, you tell your problem. You You just pour out your problem. And then secondly, you start giving thanks to God for this happening. Think about it. You start giving thanks to God. That's refocusing. That's trying to see what's behind it. And as he began to go through one thing at a time. His goal was that by the time you get through with that, you're rejoicing and happy for what God is doing. One time a guy came in and he was about to go bankrupt. And after we got through listing all the reasons he should be thankful that he was going bankrupt, he said, man, I'm getting excited about going bankrupt. Thank God that I'm able to go bankrupt and all these spiritual blessings to come into my life. And this is how we do it. We Give thanks, not only in, but also for all things the Scripture teaches us. And so Jacob and Esau, after 20 years, came back together. It was a traumatic time. And then later Isaac died and he called the grandchildren together. And I have to believe that that was finally the time when it all came together for Jacob and Esau through all of their problems, through all of their failures, through all of their sins, through all of their profaneness, their pride, their self-serving, their disregard of others and of God. That was the moment that they began to see that 3D picture of what God was doing by His grace. His grace. And I have to believe that they saw what I saw. I love you.